Greetings, everyone. Daniel Tut here with Dwayne Roussel, who is currently in Dublin, Ireland. Is that Cork. right, Dwayne? I'm in Cork. Cork. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, welcome to the show here. We're super excited to have you. Um, Dwayne and I have known each other for uh, over 10 years and really have shared a kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of some kind of adventure in thinking, philosophy, psychoanalysis, politics. Mm -hmm. And we always uh, try to make an, inv at least as I see it, our conversations are high level. We kind of try to make an inventory and ask, maybe we could say the um, the big the big questions. And that's what I wanna have Duane on the show today, to, to look at some of the big, the big questions um, that concern us in this sort of field that we share alike. Now, let's start off, Duane, by sharing, if you don't mind, this experience that you recently had fleeing Russia. You were teaching in um, Siberia, and you you actually were forced to leave because of the war. Can you can you share a little bit about that experience? Sure. Um, yeah, I was I was teaching in Tumin, and. Uh, I would say it was a position that I in, I enjoyed. I had a lot of freedom there. Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons I went to Russia, particularly this university, was because it gave me a space where I, I felt like I could think and I could explore in my uh, strange way what I couldn't seem to do in the, it seemed to me, in the Western world. Uh, so I, I really liked my position there. And when the war happened... Um, things changed, uh, as it often does for psychoanalysis. You know, I, it occurred to me yesterday that Freud, of course, developed his concept of the death drive at a time of war. Lacan developed his notion of the cartel um, very early in his teaching. When there was a war, um, you can read about it in British psychiatry and the and, and the war. Uh, and you know, so the war happened, and I immediately noticed things changed, and the the old social bonds that seemed to maybe they were fraternal social bonds that seemed to have existed at that university that made us quite the collegial and cordial bunch suddenly dissolved. And, uh, and, and faculty meetings were um, really difficult to bear. People were screaming at each other, swearing at one another, accusing each other of being Putin supporters when it's clear none of us in the room were. And uh, our students were being arrested. Um, the FSB was investigating faculty profiles at the university. And so, uh, some of us made a decision to leave. I left and uh, we went to Kazakhstan and we were in Kazakhstan for about a month, uh, which is the maximum term of my legality in Kazakhstan. And then we tried to get to Dublin in Canada. Canada, we couldn't seem to find a way, though I'm Canadian. Uh, so we, we aimed at Dublin, and uh, but we couldn't seem to find a straight path. And what was really interesting was that because and it was an adventure because we took a sort of unexpected journey outside of the path that we had planned for ourselves. We ended up in Budapest and Vienna. And in Vienna, you know where we ended up, Elio? We ended up at the Freud Museum. Uh, and I was on the third floor of the Freud Museum where there was an exhibition about the war and the reinvention of psychoanalysis during the war for Freud and his colleagues. Hmm. And then I ended up in Dublin. Hmm. So, um, and now I'm in Cork. Wow. Let's let's flag this question of psychoanalytic concepts and wartime uh, for a moment, if if we could. Uh, you made two references: one to the theory of the death drive, uh, which I was just reading uh, as a sort of side point. I was reading Derrida's posthumous uh, response to Foucault after Foucault died. Um, hmm. And he said something quite interesting, which is that the Freudian theory of death drive 
could be understood as a way to contain the madness of civilization. You know, from Foucault's early dissertation all the way to the end of his life, this theme of madness returned and returned and returned. And that Foucault uh, wished to extinguish Freud and return to Nietzsche. So to put Nietzsche first and Freud before, or to prioritize Nietzschean madness in some sense, because, because for him, psychoanalysis domesticated madness. And it did so in part through its own conceptual work and so on. And that was interesting to me because it also <laughs> is a very similar claim that Kojin Karatani makes in his book on Freud, which is actually that in 1920, Beyond the Pleasure Principle was a response to the war. It was also a response to Freud's uh, necessary retainment of something aristocratic in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so the death drive, at least for some Marxists, we could say, could be theorized in that way, uh, which I find to be an interesting proposition, uh, you know, uh, because it, 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 it lends itself to a thinking of Freudian concepts as, I don't know, liberal conservative, right, politically speaking, right? Uh, so I wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about that. What what is the what is the novelty of of uh, theory or of thought, philosophy and psychoanalysis in wartime? But I know you've been you've been writing a lot about this and hosting seminars with Julie as well. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, seminars alongside Julie. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I heard what you were saying, uh, domesticating madness. Um, it seems to me that some of the most profound inventions or novelties, as you put it, in psychoanalysis have emerged in times of war. Um, and I think, you know, to put it really simply, it has something to do with the way in which war wages a fundamental attack upon the very principle of the social bond. And when the social bond is under attack, it becomes necessary, I think, to invent a link. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about how, okay, the school, the concept of the school, the psychoanalytic concept of the school, uh, with the cartel as its fundamental organ, it's, it emerged as a solution in the context of war, as an invention in the context of war. That's when the first idea emerged. The affinity group in the anarchist tradition, which is a small social bond, uh, somewhat similar to an, uh, a cartel, but there's some key differences, of course, also emerged in the context of war. It was an invention by the FAI, a militant, some would say idealistic um, wing of the uh, uh, anarchist communist movement in Spain. Um, Murray Bookchin highlights this really well. Um, but it emerged in the context of war and it was only subsequently transported into the American Anglophone Western uh, sort of uh, political scene. There's something about war that necessitates um, an, an invention uh, of how to how to relate to the other when the other falls. Yeah, I'm thinking of Lacan's essay you referenced on British psychiatry in the war, which is a beautiful intervention in part because it really is an homage and a dedication to Wilfred Bion and his uh, innovations as an advisor to the British war effort, right? Because what Bion did was he, um, in a highly practical way, took Freud's insights in group psychology and um, trained uh, battalions of British soldiers to work more cooperatively with each other in the context of war. And in a way, Lacan said that uh, he was advancing the insights of Freud's uh, war trauma neuroses from the First World War to better fortify the military unit. So there's something also about trauma and this thing, I wanted to see what you think 
about the centrality of trauma because you're talking about a social link and I definitely can see that. Although I think when we say a social link, I'd, I'm also wanting to invite you to say more about sure. about 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 this because is this primarily for you a theory of discourse? And what would you say apropos trauma and war? What, what would you say to those provocations? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think I would say that there is something traumatic in war, obviously. Um, and I would say that it's clear that something uh, happened uh, maybe in the 1970s. It's clear that something happened. Um, what Lacan called the nom de pair, the paternal function, something like that, had fallen. And, um, and, and something took its place. Uh, the question became what took its place? The nom de pair is a vertical function. This is what Eric Laurent pointed out in his um, essay on the group and the real or whatever it was called, where he's commenting upon British psychiatry in the war. The nom de pair is a vertical relation. Marxists have been always preoccupied with the vertical relation. So have anarchists, of course, with the vertical relations of power. When we're talking about exploitation and oppression, I think we're mostly talking about a vertical relation to power without recognizing that when there's a crisis in the vertical dimension of power, it's still possible that the old mechanisms of power can shift into a different register and sustain themselves through a horizontal function of power, uh, what Lacan called fraternities at the end of his seminar, the father or worse, or worse. Um, and I think what I witnessed when the world collapsed in Russia, from my personal experience, what I witnessed was precisely the way in which when the non de pair falls or when the structuring principle of a world falls, suddenly there's a principle of fraternity and there's a horizontal principle of segregation. Perhaps the affinity group is a principle of segregation in the end. Um, it's a I think the cartel provides a corrective because what it proposes is neither hierarchy nor fraternity, neither um, neither uh, uh, vertical relations of power, exploitation, and oppression, nor horizontal principles of segregation and fraternity. And, and the way it does that is really interesting because it doesn't attempt to abolish the place of power, as Saul Newman calls it, the place of power, um, which is something that the anarchists often want to do in the affinity group model. It doesn't abolish the place of power. It simply um, makes use of its function for the purposes of disrupting the group effect toward um, hierarchy and fraternity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the essential move of the cartel. Mm -hmm. And so what happened in the war when um, the structuring principle of the world collapsed, at least where I was, is suddenly everybody wanted to segregate from one another. They wanted to split into groups. You're a Putinista. You're not. You're this, and we're, and and there was a there was a there was it 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 produced a, a segregation where people isolate away from the world together. I think that's how Lacan put it. They isolate together. Hmm. So the paternal function declines historically that's an interesting point because when we say that the 1970s we often get in hot water we get in trouble because we i think put forward a we run the risk of put forward put, putting forward a vulgar periodization i'm not accusing you of doing that um but the the verdict is not yet out uh as it pertains to <laughs> when the paternal function uh, declined, etc. And I think that in, in Lacan's early essay on the formation um, of the Oedipus complex, I think, gosh, 1953, so very early, uh, he really locates the decline of the paternal function much earlier back, right? And so there's a kind of varied, there's, there's different ways to theorize that uh, depletion. And one of the things that it invites us to consider is this notion of a um, 
fraternity as experienced around in, and I want to invite you to say something about this, a kind of return of the paternal function in imagined form, in, in, in exaggerated form. And I'm wondering if you've thought much about this, like this is something that Zizek writes a lot about where, you know, okay, contemporary culture undergoes experiences wherein uh, groups have a tendency to invent monstrous fathers, for example, right? And there's a specter of a kind of brutal father of the real, we could say. But for the group, it's largely um, an untranscendable identification or invention. So it takes on a kind of fantastical status. And that I was wondering, is that what we mean by a different theory of horizontalism, a horizontalism which cannot experience a break from verticality in some sense, mm -hmm. a kind of bad horizontalism, perhaps, mm -hmm. an untranscendable horizontalism. Mm -hmm. And I think we could maybe even create an itinerary of examples of that type of um, relationship. And then the question is, okay, well, what exactly is the relationship towards and, and then how do we um, speak of this dynamic without further furthering segregation, furthering segregated communities? Yeah, because then it, it naturally invites the question of solidarity into the mix, right? Um, is solidarity, solidarity even possible in such a dynamic? Hmm? Would, be another, would be another question for me that I would want to throw onto the table. Uh, so maybe we could start by picking apart this, um, the non-duped air. Because Lacan would be very comfortable to say that we live in a kind of age or an era of that. Could you talk a little bit perhaps about what the consequences are of that shift, perhaps? Because I think maybe some people are less familiar. Because that seminar is not, has not been translated into English. It has been uh, by the Irish Lacanian group, by um, Gallagher, but not by an official academic form of translation, right? And we only know about some of its ideas really, I think, through people like Zizek and others. So maybe you could say a bit more about that? Uh, about, about what? In about the non duped air. What is this concept for Lacan? Just so maybe the listeners kind of get a better feeling for it. Mm. Um, well, I think it, it obviously it shifts in Lacan's teaching and it gets taken up in different ways by those who are oriented by in the Lacanian tradition. But um, to, I, I think, you know, I take things very simple, very simple. Uh, the non du pair uh, for Lacan, traditionally speaking, was uh, a signifier, which was responsible for producing a fundamental no, um, a no to what? To jouissance. And so it's a very simple thesis, perhaps edible, in the sense that the non du pair um, says no to jouissance um, and therefore produces, I don't know, like a cut in jouissance, um, which is the place within which the subject becomes situated. And what happens when the non du pair uh, is foreclosed or rejected is um, the, the, that there becomes a possibility of it returning in the real. What is foreclosed in the symbolic returns in the real. And so it can return in the form of an insult. Um, perhaps you become insulted by something, um, uh, somebody outside of your fraternity has said, or what you perceive that person to have said or written. Um, so it has consequences. And um, my basic hypothesis has been, and I admit it's a really simple one, is that uh, in some sense, maybe it's a naive historical account, but in some sense, we've moved from uh, social bonds that were governed by prohibitions to jouissance, which you can think of in terms of universal prohibitions, as in the Judaic, thou shall not enjoy whatever. Um, and then, of course, we went in search of trying to get what it is that we thought we lost, 
we we shifted from that toward a society that is structured by what I call particular affirmations, which are affirmations of jouissance, uh, which authorize uh, particular uh, communities uh, to enjoy themselves. Uh, but the trouble is, of course, that it implicitly still it still includes a prohibition. It's just the prohibition exists in the real. And the point I always give just, and it's only because it's the simplest example I could think of, um, but, you know, I, I, I created a bit of a catalog of examples. It's just some of them are really controversial. The simplest example was what I witnessed when I was in India, namely the Citizens Amendment Act. And the way that it worked, and we're talking about at the level of policy, the way it worked was it didn't prohibit the inclusion of Muslims. Instead, it, it affirmed only particular social groups, their citizenship rights. So if you're Buddhist, if you're Jain, if you're Christian and so on, then you can be included in this policy initiative, implicitly writing out Muslims. And so what it demonstrates is that you can actually achieve the exact same horrific effects of fascism, of not, of, of the, the anti-Semitic uh, legislation, without there being any need of prohibitions of Jewish songs, precisely through affirmations of Jewish songs. Mm. And, um, and I, think, um, I think that's perfectly consistent with Lacan's late teaching on segregation, on what Eric Laurent calls racism 2.0, and, and so on. Um, and I think that's um, that's the the challenge that I, we're, we we should be ready to face. Okay, so that's really helpful, Duane. So the idea then is that the non-duper this signals a shift in the paternal function of what Lacan called name of the father. So the the prohibition shifts, and now it becomes around an affirmation. So you can kind of circumvent um that earlier um passageway through the castration of the prohibition and it's a kind of post um prohibitory social order and so then that invites us from a psychoanalytic standpoint to try and be specific about what type of structure that elicits and people have theorized different things they have theorized some shift in neurosis neurosis is not what it was in freud's time right precisely because of this shift in the prohibition they have said that well hysteria kind of has a takes a center stage others like zizek have said perversion does and you have written a book which i really i was just reading last night um you're one on lacanian realism actually where clinical and political uh, structures, which is a very precise intervention, I think, into this problem of, we could call it maybe a problem of naming, but also a problem uh, of how to differentiate the clinical structures of neurosis, perversion, psychosis in, polit in the political field. And I wanted to ask you where you're at with that these days. Do you, do you feel that psychoanalytic theory contributes a lot to our understanding of politics when we're able to be more specific about these structural formations? Or are you maybe less interested in pinpointing the logic of structure? Um, where, where are you at on this right now, out of curiosity? Um, it's tough to speak about pinpointing the logic of structure, I think, because um, maybe there are some who want to believe that they can isolate one particular structure. You know, as I did in one of my books, I think Jacques Lacan and American sociology uh, said it's a perverse structure. You know, incidentally, I'm thinking spontaneously, where does perversion lead in Lacan? It leads to perversion, the turning toward the father, which means that there are many fathers, which means if there are many fathers, there are many solutions, which means ultimately um, um, it's a question of jouissance. And so um, I think I'm, I'm very interested in the way in which people organize their worlds today or try to. Uh, 
uh, in a time where it seems as though the question of structure itself is fundamentally in uh, uh, in jeopardy. Mm. 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 Yes, I could not agree more. I feel uh, I feel very much in solidarity with that point. Although at the same time, I do think that maybe there is a symptomatic. I mean, there's a symptomatic uh, impulse, uh, perhaps to uh, arrive at a certain theoretical point of clarity, which I think is actually should be should be celebrated. I think that's actually a strength of psychoanalytic thought. Uh, although I think the interesting thing about the later Lacan <laughs> is that so much of the parlette of the speaking body, uh, uh, that later Lacan of the sent home of his turn to Joyce really in a certain sense also i think gives us a new theory of narcissism in some ways and i'm 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 saying this precisely because of what you just said about about enjoyment about jouissance when lacan hints at the sk bow of the soapbox the notion there is that uh, the field of late capitalism we could say uh for has experiences a kind of overall diminishment in the field of the other and a crisis therefore of desire as well as the sense in which the subject only speaks to the register of their own enjoyment so there's a that's a kind of a theory of narcissism as i read it obviously that theory of narcissism is different say than otto kernberg's theory of narcissism which christopher lashwood developed but nonetheless i see it like that and i think that it gives a lot of insights and i also would say that some of these um points on structure maybe they should be taken up as insights as opposed to scientific diagnoses right really and I, that's more how i relate to psychoanalytic theory these days as a kind of set of insights right that we can kind of work with to predict social social and political phenomena right to describe it more adequately Hmm. Um, so yeah, so, and I, I think Duane is unique as a left Lacanian, broadly speaking, in the sense that I see you as really working a lot with that later Lacan period of time, right? And, um, you are, are, are you study a lot of Malaire's work as well. And I want to ask you generally, what are you, what, 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 draws you to that period of Lacan? What attracts you to that? And like what, uh, especially with Malaire? Yeah, yeah. Tell, it's, me, tell me about your connection there. Well, I, would, I would say it began with my commitment to anarchism. Really? Which, yeah, um, although I can't trace the whole uh, history for you today, uh, anarchism eventually brought me to psychoanalysis. And it was psychoanalysis and my own experience of psychoanalysis, which lasted a very long time and perhaps is still going on, um, that brought me to Malaire. Um, because what you discover in analysis is the same effects you, perhaps you discover at a time of war. You lose your world. And when you lose your world, you discover there's something that cannot be prohibited that cannot be cut by the signifier, something that repeats, something that persists, and that something is jouissance, and it's enigmatic, and you can't speak about it, but maybe you can circumscribe it. Um, and it was Miller, I think, that, that, um, that really isolated this moment of, you know, it, it occurred to me last week that Zizek always says, He's our friend, I know. Uh, Zizek always says, we should be willing to go to the end. And what that means for me is the end of my analysis. And the end of my analysis is a very um, difficult point because at the end, you end up returning to something, analysis again, perhaps, where something cannot be extinguished of your enjoyment, of your suffering, of your trauma. It persists. And it's Miller and Miller's teaching that can orient you when your world falls in my belief and that can 
uh, provide a particular reading, and it's not just Malaire, um, but that can provide a particular orientation in the reading of Lacan that I find to be quite productive and quite helpful. Um, one that is not merely about um, um, interpreting something at the level of the totality, uh, at the not about uh, uh, simply traversing the fantasy, but how to live with this enigmatic jouissance, how to live with trauma. Yes. So I feel that this term jouissance from certain standpoints um, could be perceived as a kind of mystical kernel of Lacanianism, right? It could be perceived as um, not merely a kind of um, uh, paradoxical concept, which it is, obviously. I think there's several, there's an essay called The Paradoxes of Jouissance. Um, oh. But in fact, um, what I like about what I like about it is that it, in my own sense, necessitates a dialectic with love. And Colette Soler, another exceptional teacher of Lacan and psychoanalysis, has this idea that love is what humanizes this more monstrous form of enjoyment. Mm. I thought maybe that might be an invitation to you to talk about love in relationship to this problematic of this stickiness of jouissance of this kind of uh, you know um, because you've Duane has just written a very interesting book a collection of essays with Atropo Press called Real Love and um, how would you put into dialogue or discussion the relationship between love and jouissance? It's really tough because when we're talking about uh, jouissance um, that can be thought of in terms of the one, you know, because Lacan's idea in his late teaching, and perhaps it's quite fundamental that I mention it, is that um, the big other doesn't exist. There does exist the one. And the one can exist in the mode of segregation, isolation, um, it can lead toward the isolation of what some call, Lacan called, I believe, somewhere, the one all alone. Um, and the ones all alone, um, what I call singularities, I use the term in a really broad sense. Nobody is, it's not, it's not a technical term. People use it different than how I use it. I use it more sociologically. Um, these singularities, which are like, they organize according to their certainties. You know, they, they have not accepted... Uh, you might say castration or constitutive lack or split, and so it appears outside of them in the real, in the form of an insult or or, or something like that. They're bubbles of their communities that are like bubbles. Um, these uh, these uh, these singularities, I think, are in some sense closed in upon themselves. They tend to speak monologues, masquerading as dialogues. For a dialogue to happen, it requires love. I think it requires love. And Miller said somewhere, love is what can, I think I'm quoting him exactly, love is what can mediate the ones all alone. Um, love uh, can exist there where, because singularities have canceled their subscription to the unconscious, love can invent a means of, of uh, relating to the unconscious. And uh, in this sense, I would even say that if we're going to reinvent psychoanalysis, it will have to involve something of love. My, my first intuition is it sounds very Hegelian. I mean, in the sense that um, it's an invocation of a kind of um, defective alterity, right? So if broadly speaking, the condition that we started with of this non dupe there um, produces a diminishment in the field of otherness and our commitment to the big other and so on. We can talk about that. Um, love then intervenes in a different way as almost like a reinvention of the other or a reinvention in some sense. Love is like a... So there's that dimension of love. But then there's the other dimension of love, which we could say is a kind of... Um, a big question that I've been concerned with as well, which is... Uh, 
you know, if there has been some kind of crisis of the symbolic and so on, this 1970s thing and so on, you know, I've been reading some philosophers and I could name their names, but I don't need to. In short, they say, well, we do need some kind of some kind of return, right, to a, a, a prior mode of sociality, a prior mode of social relation before we can rebuild, if you like, the superego in a traditional Freudian sense, right? Um, so then, so love that for you is this kind of social act which would allow for communities of segregation to communicate with other communities of segregation. And maybe it was one way to say it. Solidarity. A love is solidarity. Love is also that is is love that which brings you out of this um because singularity in a certain way has a kind of resonance that's quite positive, right? This is sort of what we're after, right? Especially in an individualist kind of euro euro centered culture and all of the possessive individualism of Protestantism and so on. Singularity is a kind of um a form in which you are beyond the structure, right? You're not merely just reducible to psychosis, perversion, neurosis. You're, you're, you've invented what Lacan calls a syntome, right? And, and that, but that produces a certain loneliness in a certain way. And so I'm wondering about loneliness and love. What would you say about, because I think in a, in a paradoxical sense, we have a very sort of lonely culture and there's a kind of, profound and elusive loneliness. Uh, so could you say something about that? Sort of love maybe from this more collective and love from this more singular individual, perhaps. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I could say. I kind of, you know, I, 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 I don't have any theories. I know it seems like I do. I really don't. I just kind of say things on the spot, you know, and, and whenever I talk about a book that I wrote or something, I don't even know what I wrote. I don't, I, I certainly don't believe in anything I wrote in my love book, for example, anymore. Um, but uh, I, I, I would agree with you. I think, um, I think we're in a very lonely age. Um, I think that uh, uh, I think children are very lonely today because of the new liquid sort of family structures that exist. Uh, and I think that uh, what I find really interesting is the way in which these lonely groups exist, but they nonetheless, they exist together uh, according to a shared ideal often. Mm. Uh, not always, but a short, according to a shared ideal, maybe it's a certainty regarding the other or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is in the Turin theory of the school, which is a classic text from Miller, uh, Miller points out that what the school does at the moment that it's instituted is to return each to their solitude, to their loneliness in relation to their cause. And so I find what the school demonstrates to me is that um, just because we're lonely, it doesn't mean that there can't be some form of social organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, right, right. And I guess with that point, you have a sense for Malaya that there is, uh, you know, Miller, <laughs> politically, I think his teachings, his interpretation of Lacan do not do, they, they invite a lot of problematic conclusions in my view. And I mean, you know, we could invoke his recent intervention on the trans debate, which putting aside the, um, any conceptual points that he tried to Put forward there the mode of his intervention the kind of um uh, was was so problematic for me that it it turned me because it, it seemed to heighten a certain tension and a certain mm. set of resentments right it, it, it heightened those it even led daniel i i yeah I, I think it was really insulting for a lot and it even led a lot of people to kind of isolate themselves from the school 
Yeah, and I mean, the fact that Miller confessed in the fourth or fifth paragraph that um, Lacan had uh, traumatized him, okay, was itself uh, a very, I want to say, adolescent thing to do. In, in other words, it was uh, maybe not becoming of someone who's supposed to, you know, he he did a 180 from, and for me, like, you know, I think people have necessary dignity in this world and to experiment with tearing all of that down and playing the fool. And we know that Lacan played the fool quite a lot, but not always. Right. I mean, this, this, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a um, important trope actually to, to play the fool, to play the dupe in a certain sense. And I wonder what you, you might think about that. What, what is, and we obviously see this in a lot of philosophers, the importance of knavery. And we, we see this even in, um, as, a, as a general problematic of the enlightenment as self. I was just reflecting on the profound uh, intervention of Remo's nephew by Diderot, right? Uh, and this is what the text is about, right? Which is a, a problem of the performance on mastery as such, right? So the philosopher, the psychoanalyst, the intellectual, right? Actually, at some point, strategically must play the fool, right? Although when Malaire played the fool in the trans debate, it didn't, it didn't work out in my view at all, right? And I don't even know if that was his objective. So I guess taking a step back, I'm curious what you... What you think about that? Because I do think that uh, maybe we have lost touch with the uh, importance of that notion of throwing them. I mean, even a thinker like Jill Deleuze was so obsessed with this motif of nonsense and Lewis Carroll, right? And um, Artaud. And you, you see my point. And I wonder in a certain sense what that means for us today to to take that because also i think for lacan it was also an ethical question mm -hmm. for the analyst as well can i can i make a, a brief point here because i'm, I'm also freestyling duane as you can tell but please please yeah i i, I like the the freestyling um i i think you know it's really quite fascinating because um the non-dupes air they also wander I learned that recently in, in my yeah. analysis. They wander and they ramble, which is what people do during times of war. Make no mistake. There's a lot of non-dupes in the time of war. And Lacan was clear. The non-dupes might err. They, there might be an error there. But they you, you can say that non-dupes do exist. You know, it's not like we're all duped. Non-dupes do exist for Lacan. And they exist particularly among the psychotics melancholics and so on you could say there's a non-dupery there and it's it's testified in their certainty when they speak with such profound certainty the non-dupe is a category and um and so I, I find that quite fascinating because if i if we can say anything today i think what we can say is that there's a lot of people who are not duped by miller they're not duped by miller uh miller himself in that piece discusses the way in which he likes to play with language. Hmm. If I remember him, it's like he, he liked being surprised by the things he said. He's in love with his unconscious. Not everybody is. And I think it's an, a really important point because the non-dupes air, and you know, I, I know what it feels like to be non-duped. It's not a good feeling, in fact. Hmm. Um, so uh, I think that this has produced what I call malaria. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I have a transference to malaria uh, specifically. I may have had it at one time, just as I may have had a transference to our friend Slavoj as well. Hmm. Um, so I'm not defending malaria, but uh, I'm witnessing the effects of his discourse upon those who have read it. And what I've witnessed is... Uh, you know, I'm a segregation. 
Hmm. Um, and and I think it's perfectly consistent with the logic of the paradoxical logic of the world today, or what there, there exists of the world, because the world doesn't exist in the same register that it used to exist in. Mm -hmm. you know, all the world is mad. That's what Mal that's what Malaire said. Everyone is mad. We're all mad. In a way, the non air proposal has to do with this decline in um, the sense in which of a, a crisis also of belief, of the very category of belief as such. And now the category of belief is it's it's now possible um, to to not be duped by your unconscious would be one way to to say it. And I think one of the ways that translates into a more practical register in these kind of communities of segregated enjoyment that we're talking about is that maybe we could say they develop forms of relationality with one another and communication, you could say, in which it's more and more un it, it's very hard to be self-critical in a certain way. It's it's um very hard to sort of get outside of the of their own transmission, of their own discourse, and so on. So there's that um question also of a kind of facing it up to lack yeah a facing up to indeterminacy a facing up to the unknown and therefore a question also of modesty it's no surprise lacan said the most important virtue is modesty hmm? and i think that he said that as a historical point specifying and pinpointing this crisis that we are facing hmm? which is why Lacan also speaks to us today, right? Mm. The, the, the social political dimensions of Lacan's time still in many ways resonate very much with our own, I think. Obviously, this is less so with Freud, in my view, okay? People like Tupanamba, our friend Gabriel, would push back on this, and I think others would push back on this and actually say, well, actually, Lacan actually is is dated you know and we can we can move beyond certain you know and that's another big debate because i think the malarian tendency also possesses with it a um a kind of a freezing a freezing uh, a kind of codification of a particular period of lacan we could say or even of lacanianism it becomes a lacanianism what the number would call an ideology yeah hmm. which actually um leaves things kind of in the 1970s, 80s. That kind of freezes us there in some sense. And I'm not sure how I feel about that view. I'm I'm torn on it. And um, I wonder where you're at with it, if this makes sense to you. Uh, it, it does make sense. And I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but in my personal experience, it's precisely not just Malair, you know, but there's so many great thinkers in the Lacanian orientation. I'm really, I'm, I, I, I find uh, um, Marie Ellen Bruce really helps to orient me. Um, Veronique Varouz. There's a lot of thinkers in the Lacanian orientation, and and not just Malair that are producing one. Eric Laurent, of course, that are that are doing wonderful work. But um, what's interesting is that this teaching, I would say Malaire's seminars have were, were really important for me because what they did was they allowed me precisely to return to the early Lacan, mm. to return to the middle period of Lacan mm. after I had, I thought, somewhat abandoned it. And I'm reading it differently and things are resonating in a different way. I'll give you one example. I returned to the third seminar just to prepare for some stupid lecture I was giving. And, um, and I discovered that when Lacan was the third seminar, when he was discussing not just foreclosure, of course, the formula of foreclosure that we all know, um, but also he was discussing the particular case of Schreber and how in his earlier, if I remember it correctly, more melancholic period when he was in college, Lacan said, you know what stabilized him? You're talking about Schreber or Lacan himself? Schreber. Ah, Schreber, yeah, Schreber. what? What stabilized him was... Um, his relationship to a college fraternity. Hmm. And he highlighted there how the fraternity kept him uh, stable. And so you find these little pieces in the early Lacan, the middle Lacan, 
yeah. um, after passing through the late, I think it's only by passing through the late that I'm able to sustain my interest in the early Lacan, in the middle Lacan. Like fund now I'm interested again yeah. in the early Lacan. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been reading the early middle Lacan in a really long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, I, I agree with you on your point about modesty. Um, mm -hmm. Although even more so, I was reminded by uh, uh, a friend uh, in Dublin uh, a week or two ago who reminded me that for Descartes, what's virtuous is clarity. And I really like this even more than modesty because clarity, it's not simplicity and so on. I had a discussion last night about this with somebody. It means to clear the path, to clear away the noise, to sort of get some, to see a way forward. Mm. And, and I think that's what Malher has done for me, uh, Malher's work and those who are kind of oriented by some of his, his uh, teachings. The, the, one of the clearings that I've noticed and it has to do with this notion of modesty, is precisely the fact that, well, what is modesty? You said, knowing that you don't know some things or something like that. You know Donald Rumsfeld and Zizek's point about the known unknowns and the unknown knowns? Mm -hmm. I made this point just um, just yesterday. Somebody brought this point to my attention. Mm -hmm. They created this mm -hmm. quote with me because I was, suddenly, I was producing a bit of a critique of, of Zizek. It's not a critique. It's a twisting of his ideas into mm -hmm. a different register. The idea was that, you know, um, Zizek claimed, right, that for Rumsfeld, his reason for going to war, I'm sorry, I know you already know it. I'm just going to repeat it for a moment. It's, okay, he said there are no knowns. There are things we know we know, like, the example that Zizek gives is I know that I'm in a room and there's one light here to the right of me. And I know that I know that. Then there are known unknowns, the, the things I, I know that I don't know. Like I know that there's people wandering around in this building. I, know, I don't know how many people are there. And then for Rumsfeld, he said there are unknown unknowns, the things we don't even know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is traumatic. <laughs> this is the hole in knowledge, right? And he said this is his justification for going to war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we don't even know what we don't know about the weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. Zizek brought ideology into mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. And here I think Zizek, sorry, I, you know, Zizek's great, but I don't think he was properly listening to Rumsfeld. Hmm. You know, with analytic ears, listen to what he's saying. It's not that there's some domain of unknown knowns, tacit, unconscious knowledge that, that uh, compelled Rumsfeld to go to war in Iraq. What Rumsfeld said was he was terrified of the unknown unknowns. And to be terrified of that hole, that trauma, necessitates the known knowns. You know, and it's precisely because he didn't know what he didn't know that he was compelled to state with absolute certainty that he knew that there were weapons of mass destruction. And I think that today, in an age of profound certainty, when we know that Malaer is transphobic, and we know that, um, then I think what we're dealing with is um, maybe a lack of modesty, but I don't think what we need is more modesty. I think what we need is some clarity. We need to clear away some of the, the noise. So then Rumsfeld is more concocting a kind of psychosis like it's a it's a um a foreclosure which returns but from from but you've kind of flipped the way that Slavoj uh, talks about the movement of that logic uh and could you relate that to Schreber perhaps I'm curious how would that because this then ties us back into this question of what is psychosis today etc at least at this level right political social level I wonder, I wonder what you think there, because the big thing in the seminar on the psychosis what is the notion that psychosis is held together by what Lacan calls the point de capitan or the quilting point. And the quilting point uh, is necessary. Otherwise, you have a psychotic break. The uh, signifier of the quilting point for Schreber is the idea of being a father. That mm -hmm. was that was what uh what was foreclosed yeah that quilting point uh it was necessary and it's interesting that the fraternity of the of the frat house hmm, uh provided that of, of of a kind of horizontal uh fraternity relations provided that cover that quilting point 
So what's the quilting point then for Rumsfeld in some sense, I wonder, in this example? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't call it quite, I mean, what is the quilting point? I think in the late Lacan, of course, um, ultimately what's at stake is the semblant and, you know, the signifier. He moves, he moves away from it. That's right. The signifier is the semblant par excellence for Lacan. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so in a sense, um, what holds it together is the semblant. And the semblant is just something you can believe in and perhaps with certainty. It's something you can believe in. And I think um, I think um, uh, that, that um, you know, the, the, the semblant can be a way to, to escape um, non dupery And love can be, can, can produce semblant. Yeah, I was recently watching the movie about Dick Cheney, which I didn't like on Netflix with um, Christian Bale, where he gains a bunch of weight to play Cheney. I didn't like it because it was a kind of, um, it was too fearful of a movie. It it painted uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld as unbelieving nihilists hmm? from the early days with Nixon. There was actually a quote from the movie where Rumsfeld was asked, but do we believe in the bombing of Cambodia? Is there a kind of belief at work? And I'm summarizing here, but basically he laughed. And uh, the, the movie showed him laughing like a crazy madman around the category of belief itself to connect it to your point. So in that sense, Rumsfeld is a kind of nihilist. Yeah. And I'm curious there then. OK, what what is up with that? There's some truth to that. But why I felt it was poor film is actually because I don't think that Rumsfeld is a nihilist in some sense. I think actually. Uh, Nihilism exists, of course, but actually Rumsfeld is connected to the neoconservative movement and the neoconservative movement has kind of grounded on all of these principles and so on. They're faulty, problematic principles. But to, to, to paint him as, um, as a kind of unbelieving, pessimist, ironist, nihilist, right? A postmodernist. It doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem right to me. Um, who's doing that? The movie on oh, Netflix. I the see. The movie. It was coming from this. Um, I forget who did it. Uh, it's on Dick Cheney. Anyways, mm -hmm. I, I I forget the name of it. But talk, say a little bit more then about this. Your inversion of Zizek's famous example. Say a little bit more about this. Uh, I want to get. I want to get a better grasp on it. I really like this. Well, I'm I'm not exactly sure what else I I can say. I think um, I think that um, maybe what I could say is that my commitment to Zizek's work, you know, we were students of Zizek. Um, Daniel, you and I met in Switzerland, uh, where we were studying and with Gabriel and Bree and and Sir uh, Sir, Sir John, John. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, Sir. and so many others, and. Uh, Dennis, Reza. Dennis, yeah. Well, I don't think I met Dennis there, but in, in any case, we, you know, we were students of, of Zizek, and I think my commitment to his work um, necessitated that I take some of his ideas and I explore them to the end. Mm. Mm. As you said, we should we should go to the end. It means yeah. to go to the end. I take it to mean to to the end of the fantasy, where the mm. fantasy is no longer a screen but a window upon the real, mm. and what comes after that. And, mm. and to fundamentally re-articulate my relationship to Zizek's work, mm. which is what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a number of points. And I think one of the key ones, a centerpiece, uh, a, let's say it's a point around which you can orient yourself, is his claim, which began very early in his teaching, about the decline of symbolic efficiency. Yep. And the, de the, the, decl the, the decline of symbolic efficiency implies the decline of the paternal function. And, and it, in it implies something of the weakening of the non de pair, which taken to its conclusion implies foreclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and he's even brought it to that conclusion several times. So um, I think, um, I think. Yeah, in other words, how how subjects confront foreclosure may differ. You can have a kind of hysterical, you can have a perverse, but the problem, 
is the notion of foreclosure as a structural function, as a structural logic? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think we all have to invent our own solutions to dealing with um, um, uh, our enjoyment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that tracks for me. Um, I, I, I too, Duane, will just say briefly, have been trying to push against uh, some of Zizek's, the presuppositions of Zizek's critique of ideology. I'm not yet in a place to publish this, but I have been very interested in this proposal of there's no outside to ideology. And in short, we're asking what forms of Marxist ideology critique might be put in dialogue with Zizek's Lacanian theory of ideology. And so that's a whole thing. I actually gave a talk, which is on this YouTube page we're streaming this on, um, is, is Lacanian ideology theory passive? Part of the reason that I ask that is having to do with the notion of this no outside to ideology and this notion of how one handles both the foreclosure piece, but also split subjectivity as such. And I see some dangers, both ethical dangers, as well as dangers of what I might call a politics based on pessimism, in some sense, and a kind of politics which um, uh, centers a certain conception of envy and resentment at its core, which I think is not uh, useful always for working class or proletarian politics, uh, because it basically can reproduce a fatalistic idea. Right. That and anyways, that's a general thing I want to just throw can out. I ask you, can I ask you a question? Since you brought up ideology, um, I was thinking about this uh, two weeks ago uh, while I was giving a talk, and I I was thinking about this moment in Althusar, the famous moment of interpolation. You know how how it works. Of course, I don't know how many people are watching, but the idea is that the subject is interpolated. Um, by the police officers hail, the police officer says, hey, you there, and then in turning 180 degrees, you become a subject of ideology, perhaps inescapably or whatever else. And I was thinking about how that's that's quite different than a father prohibiting your Jewish songs. It's quite different. And it even led me to wonder about Althusser's later psychosis, his melancholia, and what he wrote in his... Um, autobiography, and if it had not been present very early, I wondered if in that moment in turning 180 degrees and in being recognized by the police officer, he became part of the police officer's fraternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then this is a big question for me, then is there is there a way to circumvent a kind of because i think fraternity is the basis of the social bond after the the brothers have performed and we can talk about the anthropological scientific validity of freud's theory of the primal father but let's take it as lacan took it right which is kind of it's freud's myth but also at least in structural form mm. gives us gives us a lot to work with Let's, okay. let's say for a second that uh, society is founded on this fraternitas, founded on this fraternity, but that founding conceals with it a bad verticality. But that bad verticality is relegated to the socio-symbolic in some sense and, and its connection to the imaginary. So it needs to be overcome as a dialectic over and again and again. That to me seems right. However, what I'm less clear about is how one reinvokes verticality to produce a better horizontalism, right? To overcome some, because to me, that's what Oedipus is about, is about a theory of overcoming dependencies and overcoming bad horizontalisms in some way, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense to you. I don't know if it does. Uh, that's a big thing in my book on the family, which I'm trying to work through. Huge, huge, huge question for me, which is liberalism, neoliberalism even accelerates intensifies um repressive horizontalism we have egalitarianism we have equality but the basis of that equality is based on a kind of 
market Oedipal logic, which is a disavowed verticality, hmm? a mm -hmm. verticality which cannot be touched, which mm -hmm. cannot be touched. And I, 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 uh, I almost think that today politics is about um, puncturing that untouchable dimension properly, right? How do we how do we uh, do that? And that brings us back in a way to the anarchist proposition itself, right? Which I see as insisting on that, in some sense. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering where where we might bring that back in, in some sense. You know, um, yeah. Th th that's why I like your anarchism because it's this constant uh, wrestling with this issue of the vertical horizontal and this kind of dialectic. Um, but yeah, this is sort of one thing that uh, now I, I would just I, yeah. I just wanted to add maybe one two points. Please. One is that um, anarchism. I mean, it to me it seems to me there's kind of like two traditions of anarchism broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. There's the tradition of the I don't know for lack of a better term fraternal anarchisms, and then there's the tradition of um, I don't know maybe you could even trace the lineage beginning with Stirner mm -hmm. and moving on, where Stirner confronts. You know what Stirner was basically doing? Mm. Stirner was basically, he was confronting vertical oppression and so on. Yes, but he was also fundamentally confronting and emptying out the concept of fraternity that had been plaguing the communist tradition. He said, no ideals, you know, and you can see it also in Sergei Anakiev and some other thinkers where the idea is to build um, something that doesn't succumb to these group effects that are that are predicated upon prohibitions, exploitation, oppression on the one hand, and fraternity segregation and so on on the other. Of mm. course, that left Stirner with almost nothing. He had this empty concept of the union of egoists, mm. the union of egoists. Yeah. Because Stirner ultimately got to the position where he was a non-dupe, you know? And I think at this point, there's a reason why we can talk about Stirner as being Stirner. That's what Engels called him. Engels called him, I think it was Engels who gave him that name because he was Stern, which means to be serious or stubborn. Mm -hmm. And jouissance is precisely that stubborn element that refuses to be incorporated into the dialectic that mm -hmm. will persist long after the dialectic falls, which is why on the one hand, yes, we can speak of dialectics. It's a point that Rick Luce made last week in a presentation that was really quite incredible. And yet, on the other hand, we can speak of fixations, stubborn fixations of jouissance that cannot be brought into any dialectical framework mm. that radically resists it, that mm. is enigmatic, and that is a, a zone of affirmation. And so I think this is what Stirner introduces into the, into the um, um, uh, anarchist tradition, and the, I mean, many anarchists didn't really like it. They called him an individualist yep. without recognizing the fact that it's precisely their fraternities that are radically individualist because they're segregating uh, from the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there's something here in Stirner um, that's really important. At the exact moment when he institutes a social bond, mm. he produces a dissociation from that social bond in the same way that you can talk about the psychoanalytic school as Miller did in his turn theory of the school. At the exact moment yeah. that Lacan instituted a school, you see dissociation. And um, it's a question of what you do with that dissociation because for Stirner, he wanted to leave each egoist, as he called them, to right. his or her or their own cause. Um, and, and so it's a question of how you, how you can live with that, with that stubborn element. Right, because Lacan's critique of ego psychology is different in the sense that, uh, you know, ego psychology, I mean, out of Adlerian interpretations of Freud and beyond and so on, which is a whole thing. But for him, it was producing an aggressiveness, right? And it was an affirming of a kind of interminable um, imaginary that that it's in a way to 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 use the language we are developing in this spontaneous conversation it was only relegating the subject to the aggressivity of a bad horizontalism in some sense and its logic of adaptation and so on it was too market driven Lacan would critique that but what I think is interesting is that you still have a theory of singularity on the other side of that hmm? and I'm wondering how you wrestle with your 
Sternerite view, sounds like you have some sympathy to this, with your Lacanian sympathies. Do you see those two orientations? Because we don't speak too much about Lacanian anarchism. I think you're maybe one of the only people that I know that might hyphenate. I don't even know if you do that. Mm-hmm. But I'm. Uh, how, how would you discuss that? Can you go into more detail there? Well, I, I think it's important to mention Saul Newman's work. Um, he's done, do you know about Saul Newman? A little. Okay, he's, he's done incredible uh, work. Um, I, I'm not sure he's still writing about Stirner, but uh, but he did some really good work on, on Stirner and Lacan um, in his book titled From Bakunin to Lacan. Mm. It's the title of the book. Great reference. Uh, it, it's quite old now, that book. But um, and I don't I don't entirely agree with his reading of Stirner. I think it's very dangerous to read Stirner as a post-structuralist, for example, a lover mm. of the Bronx. And I don't read him in that way. Um, but um, the question had to do with um, how I how I consolidate uh, Stirner like anarchism with Lacanian psychoanalysis. And I would say, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I basically I don't. Mm, why? <laughs> I'm fundamentally interested in psychoanalysis. It's let, let's say it's something I believe in. Um, I believe in it. Um, I think that makes me a little different from Stirner or uh, somebody who had ideas a lot like Stirner, Sergei Anakiyev, precisely because um, I think you know when you look at Stirner, for example, what did he isolate? He isolated what he called fixed ideas or spoofs, what Lacan calls semblant, semblant. And ultimately, he wanted to be no dupe of those. And so when you look at Stirner, look at the sketch that, that Engels did of the young Hegelians. Stirner's off to the side. Quiet. You know, he's all alone. And um, I think that's, uh, that's not a place I want to be. Um, I mean, I know I'm all alone. <laughs> but I don't want to be off in the corner of a room somewhere, um, master of my jouissance or something like that. Uh, I think Stirner didn't have anything he could believe in, ultimately, except for the nothing, but it's unclear if that was something he really believed in. I think I believe in psychoanalysis, and uh, and that makes me different from Stirner because I... I I, I get involved in psychoanalytic discussions and and cartels and and groups of various kinds and and so I'm not I'm not alone in a corner somewhere. What do you think about hyphenating Lacanian Marxism? Hyphenating Combi- Lacanian. combining combining, you know this is this is a, a tendency which, on my show, I've done this whole program recently of kind of investigating what happened to the Lacanian left. Mm-hmm. And the premise of the Lacanian left, starting really from uh, Felix Guattari all the way up through Ernesto Laclau, and even Zizek as well, has been that you could say it's necessary to combine Marx and Lacan. Yeah. Where are you at on that? On that for you? What does this mean to you? Well, I'm sure there's ways you can combine Marx and Lacan if you're interested. Of course, of course yeah, there are. If you're no, interested, but, you're it necessary. Necessary. It's necessary. but I, I wouldn't want, I mean, it's maybe it's just a personal preference. I wouldn't want to use it as an identification like Lacanian Marxism or, or something like that. I, I don't think I'd even want to use it to quilt the sort of discussion around uh, around things. Um, but, you know, I, I can see it being a very productive uh, productive. Uh, way to form um, relationships with other people. But ultimately, I think it's a relationship to knowledge. When you're talking about Lacanian Marxism, you're talking about a relationship to knowledge. And perhaps as soon as you institute that signifier, suddenly there's a rush of knowledge and you can build the history of the tradition and so on. Um, it, for me, it's not something I, I, I believe in quite so much, but I, I, I find it interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, I think that there is a necessary um, uh, ongoing uh, conceptual project, which is a part of Marxist praxis to Mm. relate to psychoanalysis for like specific reasons. And so then as a Marxist, which is beyond just being identified as a Marxist, it's not just a kind of imaginary recognition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Psychoanalysis actually is a necessary appendage 
to solve certain problems of Marxism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I would affirm that the hyphen is, is necessary. Mm -hmm. And for you, it's more, I see that it's psychoanalysis is a singular thing. Now, we know for Alain Badiou, psychoanalysis is a condition of love. It basically replaces religion. It's a discourse which produces truths yeah. which are distinct from political truths. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe, I don't know maybe. how I feel about that. But I like I like I like where he's going with it. But I've always been torn on it. So. One of the things that always interests me, of course, is, is you know because what psychoanalysis ultimately it's there to understand uh, the the traumas and discontents of our societies, of our social bonds, and perhaps in our social bonds and of the social bond. And if that's our principal objective, in some sense, we could say that psychoanalysis is profoundly sociological, much more sociological than the discipline of sociology is or ever could be, perhaps. And, and that's something I, I, I would say with some conviction I agree with. But there is some interesting work in sociology that I think demonstrates that the nature of the social bond has changed. You can look at George Ritzer's work on prosumer capitalism, and there's all uh, Bauman's work on liquid modernity and so on. And I think it's a question of what Marx can still say about the social bond today. I'll, I'll try and unpack what I'm saying a little bit because um, I'm not saying he, Marx has nothing to say. I'm not saying that. But it seems to me at least the Marx, that's the sort of classical Marx that gets taught in the university, uh, we get taught about typically the Marx 18 philosophical economic manuscripts and before. You know, it's the marks of alienation, the four types of alienation. It's the marks of exploitation and this sort of stuff, which is, let's say, um, closer to uh, a traditional Oedipal social bond, um, what Lacan called the master's discourse, you know, in, in his form. It's closer to that. And it seems to me, I don't know, that when I'm working right now, for example, I don't feel quite so alienated in the work that I'm doing. You know, I don't feel alienated in the work that I'm doing. I'm not alienated within a social bond. I'm alienated between social bonds. Uh, and, and so it's quite different. You know, the social bond itself has become strange. It's not an estrangement in the social bond. It's the social bond itself has become strange or alienated. And it's a fundamentally different position. And I think this is why there's a minor debate. I tried to convince Slavo Zizek to enter into a, maybe a little friendly debate with Yanis Stavrakakis about this, because Yanis Stavrakakis recently, maybe half a year ago, came out and said, and he was provoked by Zizek to develop this idea. It's one of Zizek's remarkable virtues um, to, um, to encourage people to critique him, as he's done with me. Uh, it's, it's this this idea that we've entered a fundamentally new type of capitalism, what Varoufakis says, I know you know it probably better than I do, capitalism without capitalism. He says capitalism has evolved outside of itself. I think Jody Dean's calling it techno-feudalism now, and so on. And so what you have is a fundamentally different type of social relationship. It's a social relationship where, for example, um, the, the, the social... Um, bonds that exist perhaps on Facebook are quite consistent with one another, but you'll have debates between people on one platform and another platform. You're alienated between farms. I'll give you a quick example. I was thinking about how, you know, like a year ago, maybe it was less than a year ago, uh, they tried to cancel Eminem on, on, um, on TikTok. It's a younger generation. Tried to cancel in certain demographics. And it, it really went crazy. On, on another platform, they were celebrating Eminem. It was like they were in two complete, I think it was mm. YouTube or some. Mm. Uh, so it was like two completely different universes, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And and I think um, I think that there, there's something to this idea. And I wonder if Marx can really speak, at least the Marx pre-1844, 1845, or whenever it was, can really speak to this uh, moment that we're in. Uh, where mm -hmm. it's not that we have accepted some sort of exploitation in our lives. When I was teaching in Russia, one of the reasons I was teaching there, I could say anything I wanted. I did not feel alienated, except I felt like I 
if people just entered the classroom suddenly because I had developed all these ideas over time, nobody would know what the heck I was talking about. You needed to already have been a member of the group, a member of the you had you had to be internally consistent with the group in terms mm -hmm. of its knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think that that this is this is the position we're in now. We have these groups that are internally consistent with one another. The 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 difficulty is that it's it's a question of how you relate a, a, across mm -hmm. that, that barrier, mm -hmm. the, the barrier uh, that exists between uh, uh, groups. I, I I I I'm sympathetic to much of what you say for sure. I think it is a theory of alienation related to discourse theory, pr predominantly, I would say. And obviously, discourse theory um, is something which, you know, we get from Saussure, structural linguistics, we get from Lacan, Althusser, and then Laclau and many other schools have given us a rich uh, set of concepts to work with to understand this. I think at the same time, I, I, I have been... Um, really, really closely reading um, critiques of discourse theory lately from Marx's standpoint. And one of the things that I'm pinpointing is that, you know, discourse theory also doesn't speak of subjectivity as um, from class uh, position on the one hand. On the other hand, it has a tendency to deprivilege the role of lived experience in upending and, and complicating Dis discursive communities of enjoyment, right? And um, there's several case studies and examples I could share with you about about this. And I think that that actually might, um, because in a sense, I would say the suffering of alienated work is problematic precisely because it, it doesn't have a register in which to locate that suffering. So of course, it's unacknowledged suffering is one of the problems. I think the industrial proletariat of the time of early Marx clearly had a form of suffering which could receive social recognition, even from the intellectual and bourgeois class, which is why all of the revolutions mm -hmm. of that time necessitated a careful bourgeois alliance to working class. Mm -hmm. And over the undeniable basis of the social suffering of the proletariat, why else would communist manifestos say we must abolish the family? What a radical proposal. Clearly something is not going right with the proletarian family. Hmm? Uh, okay. If we're in some kind of post-work, post-class society, etc., I feel, and Bourdieu talks a lot about this as well, where he says basically there's only one habitus today, which is the petty bourgeois habitus in some sense. And the petty bourgeoisie refuses to see itself as a class. Hmm? So in a way, I'm of the mind that discourse, if it's to do any kind of important work, needs to make a decision and go, go, go to places that it's not comfortable to go to, perhaps, if that makes sense, and um, bring out unacknowledged suffering. And, and that is what psychoanalysis is about, is allowing unacknowledged suffering to speak. Hmm? And it returns us also to the question of theodicy, which is a huge huge interest of mine as well. Theodicy meaning a set of beliefs or ideologies which conceal suffering or which provide a solution to suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think that our neoliberal era is marked by an ingenious solution to the suffering of workers. Mm -hmm. a kind of order so I, I, I affirm that uh, lived experience of suffering still exists although it is of a different form. And I affirm that the early Marx is still an important reference for us. Question is, how do we, how do we resurrect him? That's the task of solidarity and political organization, etc. Uh, but I, I would not want to abandon it because I think when you abandon that Marx and you don't combine it with the, what Leotard calls um, old man Marx, the Marx of capital, the Marx of mm -hmm. the intricacies of the exegesis, which can go on to infinity in the unfinished project of capital. That has limitations as well because it doesn't connect to the generic. It doesn't connect to the, because, you know, in a way, Marx was correct in his thesis on Feuerbach, to your point, that proletariat is a subjectivity found between, found as an excluded universal. It's an excluded universal founded in the ensemble of social relations. 
This is on, it's, it's the term Marx uses. In that ensemble, the proletariat is the excluded in between, if you like. So I think the early Marx can still be consistent with the, the framework you have developed, would be my hope. That would be my, my, my response to that. Uh, so that's, but that's a big, big thing. And I know that we are about almost an hour and a half into this conversation, which has flown by. Um, and I want to thank you for coming on, Duane. And I also want to thank you uh, for helping me with my book as well, actually, because you were the really one of the first champions of my book on the family. And I really, really honored that and appreciate that. Just wanted to say that um, publicly. Um, what's next for you? You're in Ireland now. Are you going to stay there for a while? What's your plan? Well, uh, I went to uh, to see uh, my third analyst to ask for a supervising anal to ask her to supervise practice for me. And my session ended at the time I said, I don't know, I'm wandering. And uh, it was really important that I heard that wandering is a synonym, uh, sorry, rambling is what I said. Rambling is a synonym for wandering and the non-dupes wander. Yes. So, so um, I am, I am in, a, in a wandering mode. I don't know what tomorrow could bring. Um, life is changing very quickly for me um it's it's there's been more changes even just in the last few days than i could tell you about but my hope is to stay in in ireland for a while i i got a position at the university colleges of dublin and cork and um and i'm hoping to do some teaching here and and start a practice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. congratulations that's fabulous well, I want to thank everyone that's been watching this exchange. Um, Dwayne and I did not prepare anything. We just we dived into the deep end um, without any flotation devices. And I think we have managed to have a very robust conversation. And um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And I would also say, if ever you wish to offer an online seminar, you can consider our network a welcome home for anything you wish to. And in particular, I've been inviting people to give seminars on new stuff they're doing, stuff they're unsure about, you know? So that would be an open invitation to you at any time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I wanna close by asking you if you could describe what your current research is and maybe what your, if you have a book project you're working on or anything you would be willing to share would be great. Mm-hmm. Uh I have a new book coming out titled Singularities, um, which is a book that uh, Slavo encouraged me to work on, and so I did. Uh, I think the subtitle is going to be Psychoanalytic Sociology for a Strange Time, and uh, I do, I'll be developing a lot of these ideas. Uh, what else am I working on? I'm, I'm, I'm giving these public free uh, lectures, discussions. Uh, I, I give one on Sunday. Uh, on post-anarchism and psychoanalysis. It's the final one in the series. It's the fourth one. I'll be talking about uh, Sterner, hopefully. I don't know what I'll talk about yet. I kind of make it up as I go. Uh, and uh, and I, I am working on a few other books right now. I have one coming out soon with Julie Reche, um, titled Negative Psychoanalysis. We're editing it. We have about 20 contributors. Um, uh, it should be really, really good. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's basically what I'm working on right now. We'll have to have you back on to describe to maybe younger writers in this domain how you uh, write so much. Um, that seems to be a big question that comes up, which uh, may be hard to answer, but also is, I think, important because um, you are quite productive. So, you know, hats off. On that, Thank you. and I also I also would love to talk to you more in the future about sociology and um, some of your commitments within within sociology. Um, that would be another conversation I'd really like to have with you. Uh, and so I think I think we'll close. But this has been really enjoyable, and uh, we've kind of 
it's been a fun journey. I've, I've, I think we've, we've popped open a lot of things that I've been percolating for me. So, uh, it's been helpful. It's been very helpful. And we wish you absolutely the best as you are navigating. Is Ireland quite beautiful? I imagine I've never been there. It's uh, it's an excess of life. It's just folds and folds of of, of green plants and uh, trees mm. and idioms and perverse jokes. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's awesome. All right, my friend. Thanks, Thanks everyone for watching. We'll we'll be back soon. Thanks, Duane. Hang on, I'll be uh, I'll be, I'll be with you in a second after I end this. Peace out, everybody.